This morning, I wanted to talk about understanding New York in the time and place of the Great Gatsby. I know that you'll be reading some of it, but as one of the important elements of fiction, I think we need to put Gatsby in space and time. Together, those create the setting. Because if we had said New York during the time of the Revolutionary War, it would be different than New York in the 1950s and 60s. So time is as much an element as the physical location. Last week, we talked about the Roaring Twenties in general, just as a period of time and significant events and personalities of that era. So today I want to talk about the geography, but I think we have to put them both together from last week and this week to totally understand where the story takes place and how it literally drives the events of the book. Among the things to remember is that the modes of transportation available during this time are part of the story. So the personal use of the automobile is relatively new, which is why we have discussion about the rich people having impressive automobiles, but train travel was still prevalent. And in fact, today I have people that I worked with who are living in New York and Chicago now who hardly ever use their cars because you have to pay for a separate city license and parking and storage where if you just live near a train stop, you can pretty well get anywhere you need to go by virtue of just jumping on the city train and having your fare pass and and moving around. In fact, I was watching a thing over the weekend about train travel in Europe. And the mass transit in Europe is so good that trains and buses really do away with the need for people to have an actual automobile or even to learn how to drive. So the fact that Gatsby takes place in 1920s New York, it's written as a contemporary book that comes out at the time when the story is taking place, which we talked about last week, but also that the modes of transportation, the railroad and the cars are a big deal. So let's take a look at where the story actually takes place and how that has influences on the actual movement of the story. So just for general reference, the story takes place in New York, but it's the bottom right corner where New York City is located. Pretty much the same way it is with Illinois, where people talk about Chicago and downstate. People in New York talk about the city and upstate. So either you're in the major city itself or you're out there in the rest of it. So our action is going to take place there in New York City, even though we have people who live, as you can see there, close by in Connecticut or New Jersey that work in the city. We're going to devote ourselves to New York State proper. If you're not familiar with it, New York City is actually a collection of what are called the five boroughs. So if you can see my cursor moving around, this area is called Queens, and that will enter into our story a little bit. And here you can see two points out on Long Island that we'll also be zooming in on because these are important pieces of real estate as well. Brooklyn, of course, you may have heard of. Manhattan, the main uh, industrial commercial or commercial financial district of New York City. The Bronx, up where Yankee Stadium is located. And then Staten Island, which is sort of a suburban community. But all of those five together create what is called New York City. And then each of these boroughs has a borough president and a local government, kind of the way you might think of a city commission or a county commission. So understand that when people talk about New York City, they will also talk about these specific boroughs 
because that is as much a loyalty as it is to being part of New York City itself. So somebody from Brooklyn would consider themselves a different person than somebody who lived in Queens. Somebody who lives in Manhattan is a different kind of person than somebody that lives out on Staten Island. So by reference, when they talk about these different places that comprise New York City, they really are different. They have different character. They have different characteristics that help describe the people and the events that would be in those places. Now, I pointed out to you these two points of real estate out on Long Island. So for reference again, here we see where the Bronx is located, the island of Manhattan, and here we see Queens where we were uh, just discussing. So a little bit to the east of them, we see these two areas which in the book they call it East Egg and West Egg. And really these two necks, if you will, these two peninsulas stick out kind of the way Florida sticks out from the southern United States. So living out in one of these seashore type areas, this beachfront property is considered prestigious, it's expensive, but even out in this area, there's a difference between the people that live in these two places. So even though they look like they're roughly similar, they're on the same part of the island, they stick out into the same bay, what's the difference? Well, the right-hand point, East Egg, is where the old money lives. And by old money, we're talking about families that inherited their wealth from previous generations. These are the people who don't have to actually go in and work. Instead, they can live off of the proceeds of their investments and their family fortunes. So they really have the older estates, hence the idea of old money. And these people look down on the people over on the left hand point, what's called West Egg, because that's new money. These are the people who have recently come into great wealth due to industry and commerce around the turn of the century. Because as we know, at the beginning of the 20th century, this is when airplanes, automobiles, some modern manufacturing methods, the chain retail stores like we talked about in last week's lecture, these things are coming on. So there are new ways to be making big money. And since East Egg is already full of the more historically rich people. The new rich people go over on West Egg and put up their lavish homes to compete with and be a part of this kind of society. But as you might expect, the people who got there first think that uh, they might be a little bit more deserving. They might be the more proper people to be out here in this neighborhood. You can also see here depicted on the map the typical map marking for the railroad, which is where two of our prominent characters will meet. We don't see it happen, but we hear it referred to in a flashback kind of conversation where it's discussed how these two characters met. So one option is to take this railroad from out here on Long Island to wind up adjacent to Manhattan if you were going downtown, right? Or if you were one of the people who had uh, this new automobile, you could come down this particular road, cut through this area and take the bridge into Manhattan. So it's an important aspect of the story, how it is that people traveled, even down to the point of who is in which car by the end of the story. Some of the action actually is tied to which people are in which car, on which half of the trip back and forth to the city. So paying attention to the transportation is important. So understanding the geography is important. In this green triangle, I have pointed out an area that in the book is referred to as the Valley of Ashes. And in fact, there was a big dump in this area at the time of Gatsby. And part of what happened with old fashioned trains, of course, is that they were burning coal 
and they would eventually have ashes in the engines that would get dumped and some of this debris would wind up on the railroad bed. So this was a place where between road construction and railroad waste that there was a big dump here. So we have people coming from the fancy part of Long Island over to the fancy part of Manhattan, but they have to pass through this very depressing area. And this is where we have interaction with another set of characters, uh, the Wilsons, who have the gas station and auto repair shop here in this area. All of that waste is gone now, so that in this particular part of uh, Flushing and Queens, these neighborhoods, that's where the New York Mets new baseball stadium is located. That's where uh, the United States Tennis Association's National Tennis Campus, where they have the U.S. Open Tournament, that's where that's located. That was where the site of the New York World's Fair was. And even in this area, this uh, Astoria type area is where LaGuardia Airport is located. So from being a depressing kind of way station back in Gatsby's day, now it's developed and become part of one of the major areas of New York City. But we have to think about it, how it was in those times. So we have a little orientation to where the characters were living and where they were going to and from in the course of the story. This gives you um, a satellite view from Google Maps that shows you the very same things. But here we see Manhattan Island, and here's the Queens area, and here's the Bronx, and here are two pieces of prime real estate out here on Long Island. Just from glancing at it, we can see that the built up parts of the Bronx and Manhattan and Queens and Brooklyn, right? You see a lot of concrete because it's very built up. It's very crowded, right? So other than seeing a little bit of parkland like Central Park in Manhattan and other parks here in Brooklyn and Queens, you don't see a lot of green space. However, look at how much green space you see out here on our, our two necks of land off of Northern Long Island. One of the luxuries of having real estate is to not be crowded by your neighbors. So if you get there and type a large piece of land, you can build a large house, but not be tight to your neighbors because you have a lot of green space and woods between yourself and the other houses. So just as you would in a lot of affluent areas, the idea of not being crowded is part of the allure of being out in these locations. So here we are well oriented to the places that we saw on that sketchy map. But I want to zoom in a bit for you. So we take a look at these two particular points. So we see Great Neck, which is West Egg in the, in the book. But we see that we have these two places. So on the eastern side, this is where the old money, the affluent historic families are located. And then over on the west side is where the new recent money, people like Gatsby who have just come into their wealth, would be located over here because the old families already have the eastern half well tied up. Notice that they have something called the Great Gatsby Boat Tour that is located here in this area. So if somebody wanted to make kind of a literature field trip, they could go around this bay and back and forth and see the places where the characters supposedly lived. We do not actually have a fixed place that we would call Gatsby's house. But if we zoom in a little bit further, we can see here on the west edge a current home that looks very much like what Gatsby's place would have been. And even this little road is called Gatsby Lane. So I did some research trying to find a place that looked as much as what Gatsby's place might have been. And 
we have the large mansion. We don't see Nick's guest house, but it could be sitting here under one of these trees, we could imagine. And we see this long pier and dock that, that comes out into the bay. And one of the great things in the book that's very symbolic is Gatsby out on his dock looking across the water over where uh, Daisy's house is so that he can see the light on the other dock. And that's how mentally he feels some kind of connection or longing for her. So that's something that's going on. Even we see here the large outdoor swimming pool that plays into the climax of the book. So we have some visual touchstones here. As we think about Gatsby, if it was written in the time when it was supposed to be going on, for example, World War I had just ended. There was no World War II yet. So they still called it the Great War, which is what Gatsby has returned from. One of Gatsby's acquaintances that we meet in the book is a fictionalized version of the guy who actually was the gambler who fixed the 1919 World Series. So when this book comes out, it's not the historic novel that we think of it today because we're 21st century people. No, this is a book that comes out that has the feel and flavor and currency of the gossip and the politics and the history and the culture that's going on right at this time. So it makes sense that Fitzgerald would be looking for realistic geographic locations. He wouldn't be inventing a city to make his story catch on. He doesn't need to create Metropolis or Gotham City to stand in for New York. He uses actual New York. He uses the actual configuration of the islands and the land and the transportation so that as people are reading the book, they would have a sense of being in a real place with which they might already be familiar. So you can get lost in a book when you feel like the place where it's taking, uh, where it's occurring is a real place. And it's in the real times that people were living through. So I think that gives us a sense of authenticity. In general, I think the more that realistic details can be put into a work of fiction, I think it makes it easier for the reader to connect to it because it doesn't feel like it's fantastic or made up or unrealistic to where a current reader could not relate to it. When it uses real place names, real details of the times, then I think people can be more lost in the story. And I think that's part of what makes Gatsby such an effective book because it is realistic to the times and places that the characters were living through. That'll end today's official program and I'll stay online so we can have some discussion afterwards.